Doris is my boy. This morning, they separated us. She had put him in a cell by himself down the hall. Don't worry about nothing, son. It's gonna be okay. We'll be out of here in no time. Plain truth is, I don't think the sheriff would have separated me and Dorsey if that didn't. And Drussy. I mean, God almighty, damn, she hung me up to dry this time. Kidnapping was bad enough when she started that shit about murder. So family, huh? Stick together? Not the Durkles. At least ways not as far as I can tell. You see, as long as I can remember, Aunt Drussy, that's Papa's daughter. She didn't have much use for me, like when my daddy died of TB. I was four, I guess, and, uh, and Mama left one night with his drummer that was passing through, and well, Papa took me to race, and right off, Aunt Drussy, she begins to click her tongue about what a sorry mess I was. Honest to God, Papa, I look at Coy and I just quake. If ever I seen a young one born to bring misery on others, if ever I seen selfishness, cruelty of born, and there it is. Look in his eyes, Papa, what do you see looking back at you? I see white trash taller. I see his mom. Mean little eyes. Mark my word, Papa. He'll bring shame on you, he'll end up in a reform school or a chain gang or worse. Good old lady, trust She was right, of course. I guess I managed to make the old witch's predictions come true. I mean, goddamn. Here I am, in jail. I had to believe in myself. Like, when I get drunk with David Jensen, and I wreck Papa's truck, and then I, I get kicked out of school my senior year, and then I get Frank and Jean Haskett pregnant. Well, it just seemed like Aunt Drussy was a prophet. I mean, my God, I just couldn't seem to do nothing right, you know? I used to sit in front of my mirror in my bedroom at Papa's and just stare at my face in the mirror there. And sure enough, I seen it. There was Mama's eyes staring back at me. When Frank and Jean told me she was pregnant, I had a little contact that night, just me and Mama's eyes there in the mirror. And I decided I'd clear out. I told Papa I was going to High Point. That's where everyone went back then and got in trouble. That's when he brought me to Land's End. Land's End. Papa talked a lot about it over the years. We got in his old truck with a warped axle. Warped ever since I wrecked it. We drove up through Boston Gap and out on the Blue Ridge Parkway till we come to this little rutted road. More trail, really. It made me nervous when he headed down it. There was Broom's edge briar so thick you couldn't see. Sometimes we'd have to stop and sort of crawl over gullies and rocks and low gear until finally there were no trail at all. Just laurel thick and taller than the truck and the side of branches dragging on the fenders and we was there. Late afternoon and there we were. I followed Papa to this ledge and it pointed to a place that sort of jutted out into the sky. The wind was scary and the mountains just fell away. Dropped straight back. By the time we got to that rock, that wind got so strong, I thought it might just might pluck me like a weed and whirl me away. There were clouds coasting by like big ships. And then when you look down, there are clouds there too. And, and out in front of you, as far as you can see, just rolling and shifting like we was looking across an ocean. On the horizon, you can make out the Black Mountains and Green Valley. Everywhere, the sound of wind, strong too. It pulled at you, whipped your hair, and tucked at your clothes. I got a grip on that rock, and I closed my eyes, and I sat for a while. When I opened them, my God, there was gold sunlight all over everything. Shirt and pants were cracking and popping. And there was something like singing. I guess it was all that wind blowing through the rock ages. I looked over at Papa. He was smiling. He was facing off the west, staring at the setting sun, and holding on to the branch from the lost. Holding on to the branch from the lost. I remember thinking, I've never seen him look like that. Like a man out on the ocean when he sees 
land in the distance, and maybe he thought he might not ever see land again. And that roaring wind song, God, it was wonderful and scary. Something just might give you my word more about thunderstorms and church hymns. She liked them in the clouds at night. Church hymns. And my little boy took a six pace when he was a baby, all moved into one. Everything was so loud and bright, it was roaring and sad, and we couldn't talk to each other. Finally, Papa tugged in my sleeve and we motioned to the truck over there in the low thicket. And uh, when we got in, I noticed it was getting dark. We'd been out there long and I realized. Papa rolled up the window, and my ears, who were still so numb, he had to shout at me. Ladies in, boy! Caught him at that rocky ledge. I don't remember thinking, well, of course. What else would you call it? As Papa backed and seesaw that truck around, he told me he'd come up here when things got him down. Don't tell anybody about it, Coy. He said, the wrong person find out it's here, he'll come up here and build it a campground for the Burger King. <laughs> On the way home, Papa told me I wasn't going to High Point. He said, I married Frankie Jean to get a job. We got out of Blue Ridge Parkway and said nothing for a while. We just drove and stared in the mountains and the dying light. Then he said, Coy, I come up here a lot over the years, but I only come for the sunset. I've never been to Land's End in the morning. Don't you just know sunrise would be summer? Then we were home. Then we were home and I went to see Frank and Jean. All that was over 10 years ago. I married Frankie Jean. I got a job at Scott's Creek, Texaco, pumping gas. Got three acres on the ridge above Papa's and a double wide trailer with a 10 year mortgage. Cars paid for. And I, Frankie Jean, Dorsey. This spring, Papa got cancer. He was in. Uh, Hospital by May, you know, I just had to take one look at him, though he wasn't going to last long. <laughs> I was wrong. In June, they set up the oxygen, and uh, I bee bottles, and bee bottles. Sometimes I go by there at night and sit by his bed for a couple hours, and then never wake up. By August, he was in a coma. Doctor said most of his body functions had already shut down, and his kidneys. In September, he was down to 70 pounds. Sometimes his eyes would open and it seemed like he knew us, but he was like somebody on a train caboose. I'm going to get further away from me every minute. Last night, I went to see him. He looked like a little old baby. He was all drawn up in a ball, lying on his side. <clears throat> I brought Dorsey and left him in the waiting room with a stack of comic books. I sat down next to Papa and I pulled my chair up real close so I could watch his face. It was three o'clock in the morning before he opened his eyes and he knew me. He had uh, tubes in his nose and mouth and arms. The look in his eyes was awful. It's like you and my red old man in the car here, the same. Mute, bleeding look like. You ain't gonna let this go on, right? That's when I decided to do it. I, I went to the waiting room and I told Dorsey to go down away from me in the car and then I went back and I got Papa. I had some choke with them tubes. The ones I couldn't get loose from him, I just tore out a machine and then I took them. Tubes and all. He was so light. He was so light. Like out of my bones and skin. I had stuffed a little newspaper. They had taken out his false teeth. I found these in the drawer when I left them. It was easy getting them to the car. I just walked down the stairs to the basement and right out the back. He scared poor Dorsey to death when I put him in the back seat. I told him to cover Papa with my jacket and just stay back there with him. Why are we taking Papa from the hospital? He said. I, Told him that Papa had asked me to take him someplace. 
It was still dark when we got the lens in. We stayed in the cocktail for a slide. I had a time with Dorsey, but I just kept telling him that I was going to show him something he would never forget. We watched the light turn from gray and red and pink. And when I could see my hands on the steering wheel, I, I got out and I carried Papa. I found the same rock that I had hugged in fear 10 years ago. We set up between us, Dorsey and me. He, he still had them tubes in his arms, so I got out my bar load and I cut them off. I told Dorsey to help me hold him up and we faced him to the rising sun. Blind and beat. He got his nose on the ground. Oh, man. I just stare at him. Oh, he squirmed like a worm in hot ashes. And then he said, well, what could a rooster do that a man can't? What, I didn't say nothing? He said, pick up Paul with his pack up. <laughs> well, that was sort of funny, but I didn't laugh. He was getting beside himself trying to make me laugh. Well, he went on home then low-headed and sold up. That night, Daddy told me I was being quoted. She all fooled me. Mama said, how I was going to ask me to marry him. If I was you, then it's going to take him out of it. He's a hard worker. He'd be a good provider. I'll marry him like a boy here. He's just a nice guy. Then she looked at me real queer like, and she said, even as strange as you are, you ain't going to get many offers. Didn't know I was strange. I thought about that. Well, next day, how I come by, he acted like a fool for a while, then he said, he said, man, how about you need it now? Well, I looked out at the Smoky Mountains for a long time, and then I just nodded. <laughs> Well, he hollered and danced a chick in the yard, and then he grabbed me a bear. You and me, old gal, we'll be happy. I'll do well by you. I'll build you a nice house. And then he grinned like a mule in surprise. <laughs> Here are some kids, he said, and wiggled his eyebrows. Poor fool. I didn't feel anything for how I met him or later. It wasn't like I misled him. You know, I was pretty ignorant about men. I guess I thought the way I thought was pretty much how all women felt. So we was married, and life went on, and things were the way Howard said. Oh, he built me that house, and there was always food on the table. And when poor Howard whimpered like a puppy and pawed me in the night, I let him do what he wanted. <laughs> we didn't have the hostile young ones that Howard expected. Nah, just the one boy, Woody. He was kind of quiet and sort of stayed to himself, and well, sometimes it didn't seem like he was around flesh and blood. It was like he was just visiting. He helped Howard in the field, and when he was 16, he went in town to drop the local feed school. He'd never come back. Later, I heard he was in Tennessee. And the days when Woody was growing up, they just, just all run together. together. Don't seem to be real no highs or lows. Just one day passing like the one of four. How a cloud planted. I cooked and canned, and it seemed we was going to live our whole lives like that with the days lining up like slices of plain bread. I got restless sometimes. I'd wake, wake in the night, night with the feeling I had so much to go or something to do, and I needed to get to it. And I didn't know what it was. Sometimes I dream of dude him, and I seen that devil grin of his when he'd wink like him and me had a secret. Maybe he was part of it. I don't know. Some of the nights, sometimes I'd walk naked out in the front yard and stand for hours in the cornfield. It was like someone had called me. I'd stand there listening, wait for them to call again. Then never do. Sometimes Howard would find me out there when he got up to dump the cow. What in hell, old woman, you getting queer? Maybe yeah, I was getting queer. But I hope it wasn't old. Howard still pawed me in the dark and whined when I pushed him away. Most times he whined and turned him a snore and Howard was asleep. He worked hard, he slept like a rock. I always envied him that. Well, I was 36 the fall we got dude handed to help with the hog here. Dude had a reputation of being good at but you're in the rendering line and saw the gate. He worked for Shadow Fork. Well, everybody else was out in the front yard, and I was in the kitchen rendering the log. He didn't go in with them for two nights. He laid him on the table and he said, I'll be out of Willet Springs tonight. Get the money. Now, this is the funny thing. I wasn't surprised. There was a part of me that knew what he was going to say, and there was a part of me that knew what would happen. 
When I woke up that night, it was different. I know where I was going. Why? Walked across the ridge to Willet Springs. This is a place where a little creek runs through a rock bed that's filled with poppies. Some of them 10, 15 feet deep. When I got to the bank, I could see the moon in one of them pools. It was playing that pillow. I think it was the devil's dream. I was just in my old cotton nightgown. And when I stood next to dude, didn't even look up. We've had this day for a long time, Nancy he said. He stood and took off his shirt. You afraid of deep water, Nancy? Don't bother me now, he said. Then cast your garment away, old girl, because I'm not back to you. I studied myself in that pool. I looked at a mirror. I saw that night I'd drift away. I watched as dude took my hand. And that picture broke into a million pieces and led me into deep water. Every night for two weeks we waited in that pool together. And then we'd lay shivering in the night air. And I'd stare at the stars to Luke's face and lie about it. Then one night Howard followed me. He waited till we was in the pool, two his arms around me. And he stepped out of the bank of us. Don't come back, Nance, because I won't help you. And then he was gone. Huh. Well, dude said, go to bed worse, he caught a shot. And then he laughed. <laughs> A little later, he said, best you come on home with me, Nance, to you decide what you're going to do. So I went. Stayed ten years with him and had a daughter, Flossie. Well, we was content, I guess. I didn't have no regrets about Howard. Dude told me early on, he said, Nance, I ain't the marrying kind. He stayed with me, though. Plain truth is, I was always surprised when I woke and Dude was still there. No, it was just a matter of time. Then one morning I woke, my front door was wide. I didn't take nothing to that film. I didn't know I was a whore until Fossey come home from the store and told me. She said she don't know how the woman referred to her as the bastard daughter of the whore that lived with Duke Hannah. That's how I got my name. Thank you. That's how I stayed. Me and Flossie lived in that jacket. We was going through some tough slant, I tell you. Washing other people's clothes and canning other people's food. Oh, we got by. Then Duke come back. I always know Duke wasn't dependable. And he didn't mislead me none either. He told me from the start that he didn't bomb home and told for no money. Never drew wages in his life. He managed to survive on odd jobs. He'd split kindling, kill a hog, dig a well, and do carpentry work. But it had to be short of time. When he come back, he was different. He said he'd been in jail in Tennessee. He said he cut a man. Bad things happened in that place, and somewhere along he lost the fiddle. Well, when he saw that we was living on Sour Gum Sock and Sawmill Gravy, he turned on us. One night, Flossie and me had to hide in the woods, and he threatened us with a knife. When Dude couldn't find us, he burned down the house. Dude stood in front of that burning house and shouted at us. Hey, you bitches, what are you going to do now? <laughs> then he laughed. Well, it was a good question. I mean, where could Dude Hannah's home and her 14-year-old daughter go? It was Flossie that thought of Buford Ensley. Buford lived with his parents on Slick Creek. It took us most of two hours to walk and it was dark when we got there. Flossie hollered to Buford open the door. She'd known him from a little school and she'd got at Walnut Hill before they closed it. They'd been classmates, I reckon, even though he was older than her. Well, Flossie told him about the house burning and said we needed a place to stay for the night. We needed a lot more than that. We bedded down on that floor for that night and every night for the next two weeks. Next day, I figured out how things stood. See, Buford's mom and pa was so old and looks like children. They did your Wednesday from Sunday. Spent all their time sleeping or sitting on the front porch and came by and rock was clapping and singing. Buford was sharecropping for a wealthy man named David Love. He was having a hard time. For a toe in the week and open cows for David, he had his own place and the old folks to take care of. My mind was working on a place. I fed the old folks and cooked. I split firewood. And me and Flossie kept busy sweeping and mending. Buford asked us every night when we was leaving. Every night, we better down in front of that fireplace. I was trying to show Buford that we could be a big help to him. I couldn't tell him to take his damn. 
took the cooking and cleaning for granted and still has us every night and he's leaving the next morning. For long, I took note that there was something in my kid was there. See, I forgot about Grace. Oh, she was very fortunate and kind of a freckles like a tiger lady. A healthy girl lost her. But one night I woke shivering under the flowers as we slept under and something told me not to move. Someone was standing there. It was beautiful. He knelt down and he stared across his face. His eyes wild, his lips trembling. There was a way that <laughs> those few times I went to that shack of a church on Jonathan's Creek, I always begrudged that poor I put in the collection. I always thought of back back and corn mill it would have popped. I don't know. I put that hard ball of greasy corn in that plate, believing that that I'd lost something, that maybe I'd gained something. That's the way it was with Flossie. Well, me and Buford never sat down and bought. That's what happened. Buford come one night poker. He looked me right in the face. I didn't say nothing. I just stared at me. Flossie stood. So half asleep, not understanding what was happening. Then he led her away. We had struck a ball. He would stop asking us when we were leaving. Oh, it seemed we had a home. Well, there would be other bombs between Buford and me. When Flossie got pregnant, the talk started. Preacher named Buford and Bozo were Buford that day. There weren't no church women. Yeah, that preacher married Buford and Flossie on the front porch. Roberto was gone. Locked on a while. Cooking, cleaning, washing, canning. I never seen Mr. Love. I just had to take Buford's word for it. Said he come to him and talked to him in the field one day. Said there was more people living in Buford's shack than he felt like being. Said somebody had to go. I always wondered if Mr. Love really said that. If what happened started with him. Buford had decided he wanted to leave was Roberto. Well, she was just two years old. He said he didn't think she was his kid anyway. That's the way it is, Nancy he said. You find someone to take her. You want me to give Roberto away, I said? Let me spell it out for you, he said. I'll take that young one in the morning, and you don't come back. But where do I take her, I said. He shrugged. I kept hoping it was some kind of joke, but it weren't. Next morning out of breakfast, he said it was time to go. Roberta didn't have a coat. She had a cold. When we got on the front porch, Buford locked the door. I could see Flossie in the window. She was crying. I waited. But Buford opened the door and said, Time to waste it all, gal. So we went. We walked for three days. We stayed in a barn one night and a preacher's house the next. I said that we walked, but mostly it was just me that did the walking. When Roberta got tired, I carried her. I didn't know how to do this thing, you see. I mean, nobody wanted her. Maybe I'd done it all wrong. I'd knock at a door and pretend I didn't see him peeking at us from behind the curtain. But mostly, I just said it straight out. This is my granddaughter, Roberta, I said. She's just two years old. I can't give her a home no more. Would you take her? Oh, <laughs> it created quite a stir. Before I got far from his note, I was coming before I got there. Seen somebody had gone on ahead and they told him I was coming. Some places they wouldn't even come to the door. I think it embarrassed them to turn us away. On the second day, I rode all the way to Tennessee with the preacher in a buggy. <laughs> Roberta was coughing the whole way and that didn't help none. Preacher let us out of the Tennessee line and we just went from house to house. <laughs> so we went back. Roberta's crying, Mom. I told the story. I told her lies. I told her I was taking her someplace where there was other children she could play with. Little girls like me, she said. Oh, yes, honey. Puppy dogs and kids. Oh, yes, warm house, too. Jelly and biscuits. Once I got lost. Seems like young and me spent half the day in her bed. We come out on this windy bluff where we can see the clouds beneath you. There was something scary about that place. Roberta started crying, so we went on back down that mountain. Finally, I heard a cowbell and found an old man milking his garden. He showed us how to get back to Haywood County and Jonathan Creek, and so we come home. It was dark when we got there. The door was locked. Buford hollered through the door. I told you not to come back, and you've done what I told you to. Don't bring her back here, he hollered. 
Roberta kept calling her mother. I could hear Flossie crying. So we went back, Roberta and I walking. I fell sometimes. Even though it was cold, the nights, the nights were just really cold. I'm cold, yeah. I know, honey. We'll find a warm place. Every time I see a lamp in a window, I go to it. Some places they they would turn us away, but finally some folks let us in and we slept by the fire that night. And so we visited the next morning. And we went on. Up and outside, down and on. On and on. And one place they turned us away. But they gave Roberta. I reckon you know what you say I done? That I put Roberta up in that little rock cave up on Utah Mountain. That I piled the rocks up so she couldn't get out. Mamma? Go to sleep, Rocky. I'll be back. Did I left her there to starve in that cave? Oh, I piled the rocks up. Then I know what it there would be. But somehow I feel like I had help stacking them. I wrapped that there young in that coat. I told her to wait. And I'd be back. I thought I would. I'll back down here. Back up Jonathan Street, back to Buford's. Climb the steps, I knock. Where is she, Buford said. I gave it a preach in Tennessee, I said. He hated to do it, but he opened the door at that end. Adderall, him and me, we, we had a bar. They found what was left of Roberta two weeks later. And that's why they're taking me to Swain County in the morning, where I can get a fair trial. Some folks showed up here with the rope, tried to hit me when they moved me from the courthouse to the jail. Well, I thought I could do it too, you know, knock me down, skin me up a bit. Some of them folks I recognized. Same folks that locked their doors against Roberta and me. Fella come, took my picture, called me the Jonathan Creek Witch, and then they let people come and just all day long, I sat here while them fools just stared at me. Hollered things at me. Hope they string you up, Granny. Poor oh, little Flossie clung, but she cried to take her away. So tomorrow was the big day, going to Swain County. That's where they'll decide about the breeze. I don't intend to open my mouth. I'm just going to hump up like an old mud turtle. I'll pull my head in. Close my eyes, drink my teeth, and wait. Maybe the electric man made so. I think it's like everything else that's happened in the last 65 years. I'm gonna have to bop. People are always saying they answer between a rock and a hard place. No way you can get out of this one by yourself. And then they say, let's bop. That's the way it's always been. Howard, Dude, Buford, but they drive a hard bop. But this time it's the state of North Carolina. This one is going to be the hottest bar of all. The defendant has ten state through counsel a plea of guilty of murder in the second degree which has been approved by the court and accepted by the solicitor. Therefore it is a motion of the solicitor and ordered and judged by the court that the defendant will be confined to hard labor in the state penitentiary for a period of 30 years. I was 80 years old when they let me out of prison. Rode a train to Waynesville. Had a piss on the bed in my left shoe. Flossie had sent it to me in prison. It was a long hike up John Oak Creek. It was nine and dark when I got to Flossie's. She opened the door and put my hold. I told her I was looking for a place to live. Flossie started crying. She said, I'm sorry, Mama, but you can't stay here. Well, I took that $10 bill out of my left shoe. Once she'd sent me in prison 10 years earlier, and I gave it to her. I won't be leaving this, I said. 
and I walked back down Jonathan Street. Oh, word had got around, I guess. People, people that were sent out on their porches and they just walked me, walked by. I reckon they know who I was. I stopped in this little white church, still open in the store, ready, and the man told me to sit down. Gave me a can of pork and beans and a dope pump. I, I told him I didn't have no place to live. He knew who I was. He said, Nance, it ain't no good for you to stay around here. Well, he called his uncle, said he had it in a one room shack on the dirt floor up on Conley Creek. Well, I said, all right. And his uncle said that I could have it for $5 a month. Said I had running water in the stove. Didn't have no electricity. <laughs> I said, that was That's fine. fine. <laughs> so here I am. I saw this in the and pay my rent. Well, people give me things. Oh, and them dogs is good company. Uh, sometimes I do wonder why I live so long. I sit outside in the darkness. I just watch the evening. And I try to remember all the things that's happened. So much misery. I try to remember if I was ever happy. And all that sadness, was there a day or an hour that lifted my heart? Then I think of the nights that Doonhan and I spent in the dark pool. And I see his devil light and grin when he lifts me up and my feet come off the bottom. And he said, You almost make me feel that life is worth the trouble. <laughs> and I think about what it says here in this Bible. I had that bad dream again last night. That dream where Roberta and I were lost in the Utah mountain. And I come out of one of them laurel hills in that place again where, where the rocks stuck out of the clouds. And the wind was howling and the trees were thrashing about and there was a pain. I looked over the edge and I the dishes. shot down the rest there and Roberta and me. One of them rocks. Listening to that wind and looking at them fur off mountains, I felt it. Told them, looking at them rocks, that wind it told me. The world didn't care none for me or the bird. We was just like little lens up there, just trying to crawl out of that place. The sun would burn them, or the wind would snow would freeze. Said the man, they didn't love us or hate us. Just didn't care. Didn't even know we was there. Somehow, that was worse than being here. No, it was all we know. Bertha said, Grandma, I'm scared. I said, me too, Mommy. She said, let's go home. I said, well, let's try and do that. It says here in this Bible, a time will come when the servant is free of his master. I hope that is so. For I feel like and then bonded for a long time. I sat down here in this Bible, but I want done when I die. That nobody grieve on my account. That no bells be rung. That no mourners visit my grave. That nobody remember me. That no flowers be seen there. I shine here with my name. Dim dogs, I tell you, do what you want. You wouldn't sit down and walk in the wrong. You would be nuts. Come on, boy. On a windy day in September 1952, Nance Dude was found dead at her home on Conley Creek. She had been chopping kindling when she died. They found her lying dead alongside the chopping block.
that nice vision. Vision, nice vision. Jesus. Come back and see me next year. Next year. Yes. And remember, it is CEO. That means hello. CEO. <laughs> there is hello. a sticky style. That means how are you? Sticky style. Sticky style. Sticky Ah. How are and you? Remember, when you get to motel, ask for Johnson Cornstalk. Cornstalk. Tell him that Jesse said sticky wall style. Style. Sticky wall style. Sticky wall style. Style. Yes, that's right. See you. See you. Goodbye. Bye now. Oh. Love to see Johnson's face when a nigga Island man walks up and says, How's your peck of hang? Boy, stay tight. Sometimes in July, I feel like I'm going to faint, you know. I feel like a couple of roosters roosting on my head. But I gotta keep it on. Yeah, the public likes it. And besides, the Douglas, the guy that's in the crap shot back there, if he sees me without it on, he gets all bent out of shape. <laughs> it's okay to take it off now. Yeah, that day's just about over. So, you want to hear some uh, trade secrets? Well, that there is not a Cherokee War Bond. <laughs> no, they're the guy that have a catalog. See, Cherokee, they didn't wear a lot of feathers, just one or two was about it. That's what my grandfather said. It's like the rest of this stuff. See, this, this jacket, it's novel. It costs a bundle, too, all the silk and the beadwork. Yes. And, uh, and the knife, well, it's from Sweden. <laughs> See, Dudley, he got it from a guy that sells at the craft shop. Now, now the knee pads, this is ceremonial. Plains in it, Blackfoot. Wouldn't just walk around him anywhere, like in the AAP. Yeah. Just on special occasions. Now, the moccasins. Now, they are from Mexico. <laughs> now, the choker. I got this uh, Nashville, Dakota. So you see, I am a hard right hand man. Generic. <laughs> well, it's, it's not like we're trying to fool anybody. I mean, all this is what the tourists want. See, uh, Uncle Dutzi, uh, he's my uh, uncle. He used to do this cheap night. Uh, it was uh, back. Uh, Back after the Second World War, when the tourists began coming to the Smokies. Yeah, Dootsie, he'd sit up on the bridge with his friends, watch the cars come through. See, yeah, there's only one road into the gap, and they all have to drive to a chair. Well, Uncle Dootsie and his friends would play this game, pick out license plates, find the most exotic ones. Oh, look, New Hampshire. What is that? Uh, Uncle Dootsie and his friends, they would watch these cars come through, and once in a while, they would stop. These guys would get out. They would uh, use a uh, sign language because they didn't think these little kids could speak English. And they would get out with uh, mattress shorts, out the inner J's, and student papers, say things like, uh, "Oh, you uh, you uh, where's uh, where's your TP? Huh? TP?" Well, so these guys have seen a lot of movies and got a definite idea about their things. I mean, we're all blood, right? Go up to Cherokee girls. Uh, oh, papoose. Oh, uh, uh, you got them uh, uh, papoose? <laughs> yeah, Dootsie and his friends, they used to get a big kick when Kitty want these guys would say. Oh, uh, well, you, uh, you got them, you got them papoose. Well, it's jokes on us. Look at me. Look at that. Jesus. <laughs> Must be 120 degrees inside that thing. You didn't think I'd look at him, did you? Hmm. I can see how a little kid would think that about you, right? Wait. See the chair they had little TVs. Uh, they lived in lodges with thatched roofs. No papoos chair. No, that's Plains Indian, Sioux, Cheyenne. They look down the street now. Lots of TVs and papoos took the chair for girls and street chiefs like me. It's in the 1940s and the 50s. Oh. Deuce said, oh, good day. hundred cars come through here. You know how many come through here now? Talked to a guy from the, the Chamber of Commerce. Said 9.5 million people come through here each season. Well, that's between April and October. That's seven months. But down here in December and January, no cars. Everything's closed. It's quiet. But the tribal government, they're thinking about uh, opening up bingo and gambling so they can uh, work 12 months out of the year. I don't know. I think we need five to get over to seven. 
<laughs> it's kind of strange trying to be something that you ain't. And sometimes I forget who I am. Really, I do it all the time. Like I go down to Pogonis Grill for lunch. I have some of this stuff on. I sit with my friends who are hanging out down there. And I give them my order. And they laugh. They say things like, uh, hey, just put out to like Jeff Chandler doing Cochise. It's true. It's like I, I'm still Chief Thunder Bear. You know? Oh, give me a jumbo cheeseburger, whole pickle, order of fries. Ooh, it's got to scare me. It's like I'm gonna get uh, locked in to Chief Thunder Bear and stay like that. Hey, you know what they call this street? Taiwan City. Yes. Yeah, see the tourists, they buy a souvenir, they turn it over. It's what it says Taiwan, Philippines, <laughs> Mois. Well, uh, Uncle Ducey said at the beginning, my people tried to educate the tourists with a free museum down by the bridge. Oh, uh, the families would come in, and Tommy Leatherbridge would tell them all about the chair. Uh, one of the five civilized tribes had farms, raised cotton, lots of their own slaves, too, with their own written language. But Tommy got depressed. He said the tourists were bored, so they wanted to. Want to know when the last massacre was? Mm -hmm. The chair, they, they, they take scouts. They want to play Tom Fox the war games. Oh, Tom, he used to sit there and say, You wait and see. Give them what they want. I'll just be glad that I'll be gone when it happens. He didn't live. Peace to his ashes, so to his But that's what the old people say about someone who died in the environment. Peace to his ashes. It's hard to his door. Well, here we are. I think like some guy's idea of the Jersey, what a man of American is. I almost forgot. You know what this is? Open says me. Name is Neva. About 21 years old, with a hair colored with mayonnaise, white shorts, halter. She is uh, majoring in minority cultures and ceremonies. She wants me to come over to her hotel room so that we can talk about a research paper on pre Columbian world view. Uh, we're going to talk about toads and taboos. We're going to talk about natural urges and fertility rights. Okay. So this is not unusual. Summer, this place is crawling with college girls, graduate students working on their dissertations. Oh, would you look at my thesis so I can get a handle on your worldview? <laughs> About seven more, back in the age of time. Want to go camping and, well, smoke them out. They want to become one in a dead blue tent. The dream catchers hanging in a tent flat, surrounded by an orchestra of frogs and crickets. Oh, there was this one, the University of Georgia. She had an astrological and it all worked out with the uh, alignments of the planets and the earth, and she didn't want to know. That's what she called it. Until the heavens, the moon, or two, oh, uh, two thirty in the morning. She goes, now, now! Oh, she was a screamer, kept going, we are, we are one! Oh! Mm. See, if I had had a Two years at University of Tennessee, I wouldn't know what the hell these girls are talking about. <laughs> but a couple of classes in world religion, Carl Jung, and oh, Joseph Campbell. I know just what to say. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <sighs> See, it's good they didn't know that I had college. A lot like the TV and the war bonds. They just naturally want to think I know this that it's a genetic or something. You hear something? It's like I hear music sometimes. Well, down the Pope Honest Grill, they got this jukebox. It's got like uh, the old songs in the 40s and 50s, like Harbor, Harbor Nights and Garden of Rain, and they've got money to the party. Do it now, Fox. I don't know, maybe after a couple of years of time before. It's like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, you know, pass the peace by George Day. Anyway. 
last summer. My grandfather comes down here. He doesn't get out. He lives in Big Cove. He's a what you would call a traditionalist. No rituals, conjuring, going to water, does tough with the back of his hair. Couldn't pretend to understand. Well, I see him. He comes down here to the tile on the city. He walks right on through all this. I see him at the cave, dancing chicken. They've got this chicken that dances on drums, sells postcards, has a little red feather sticking in his head. Well, anyway, I, I see him. I yell, uh, Grandfather! Grandfather! It's, it's just his grandson! Well, this old man doesn't see it very well. He hears me, knows my voice, and yells back, Is that you, grandson? He comes across the street. Well, there's this guy. He's got these two kids. He's going to take my picture. So I have these kids, and I pick them up and hold them. My grandfather comes up, and his face changes. And I still hold these kids. My grandfather says, Grandson, what are you doing? And I say, I'm cheating, grandfather. The guy takes my picture, put the kids down, and he pays me. My grandfather comes up really close. He says, No. No. You are begging. Beg. Said a couple times. And he just turned around, walked away, head shaking, no, 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 he was out of sight. Always loved that old man. When I was a kid, he used to tell me the old stories. When he finished them, he would say, Now you are the keeper. He said, The keeper of what, grandfather? He said, The keeper of stories, the keeper of tradition. Give me something. I want to say this. I don't want that job, Grandfather. Right but you've got to respect the old people. You know, like Grandfather, he's, he's like Yahweh in the Old Testament. He would say that Moses, Noah, or Abraham, you have been chosen. Now, when these guys heard this, I don't think they were that thrilled. I think they probably said, not nah, Jesus. Well, maybe they didn't say that. But when I heard that, I think they thought, you know, why would he? Um, well, I wanted to say that, grandfather was, why don't you get my cousin, Johnny Allen, he's all in this traditional stuff. And that old man's eyes looked at me. What am I supposed to say? Make good money doing this. More money than, than my father makes down at that plant at Soho. I'm putting my sister through college. She's going to be a nurse. My trailer was paid for. The motorcycle was paid for. Am I supposed to be ashamed of this? No. But, uh, at least I'm not sitting on the bridge. My uncle did this. He's sitting on this bridge. He doesn't do this anymore. He drinks a lot too. Case of Coors in the day, night, the hard stuff. Lots of people in Taiwan City drink. They did a survey a couple years ago. 62% of my people were doing some serious drink. Well, Uncle Dootsie comes up to me. He says, hey, Jesse, now that's a chief and it's dangerous work. I say, hey, I think he's making a joke or laugh. He says, no, it's like being exposed to that radioactive shit. You know, for a long time, you think everything's fine. Then it's like, eat you up like cancer. And I say, hey, give me a break. Come on, dude. I mean, most of my tips come to more than most of the salaries down this street. I'll wear this shit. Someone takes my picture, big deal. And what about the girls? You, know? I mean, you told me all about those girls. About the one from uh, Savannah, uh, Majorette. Yeah. Uh, like grandfather. She doesn't have a sense of humor. You want to know how Odus lost his job, Chief? Oh, you're not going to believe this. Yeah. Dougie comes down and finds a Doozy paint in his side. Doozy says, I don't want to be Chief Thunder no more. I want to be Chief Red Moon. But the, he doesn't like it. He says, Oh, what the hell? Well, everything's fine. It's a two issue. There's this guy in Illinois with his wife. And one says, Why is Pitcher taken with Chief Red Moon? Now you have to guess what happened, man. See, this drops his drawers, looks between his legs at the camera, moons the guy. Well, Dudley fired him. But uh, my 
family. They don't want me to tell that story. That dude, see? Down at the bridge, he's still ball. Gee, right? Oh, oh, you! She, oh, you! Drugs! Hey! Sigiyawa! Sigiyawa style, hey! I'll stick at it! Give me your king, Kaye! Yeah! Cherokee, you want to be? Another day, another dog. Well, it's about time to go home. I like to be at the holiday inn at the lake. Oh. She is going to the big second tonight. Huh? The big theater, outdoors. Out the chair, supper, and die on the trail of tears. Uh, I always love it when college girls go to the big outdoor drums. And see, a couple of hours of that, they come up and say things like, Oh, Jesse, race are the terrible things the white world has done to your people. Is there anything I can do to make it up to you? Yeah. Uh, there's this word I remember from college, history class, reparation, making amends for wrongs and injury done, to repay for damages and losses. I looked it up, to make atonement. See, sometimes I feel captive, mm. like I can absolve guilt after the nose. I'd like to say, uh, go, my child. And sin no more. <laughs> Try to help the children. Their attitude was paternal, softened, and 
before they have they walk effortlessly through time and space. A little old woman would be walking toward the village in the fall and the leaves change. My favorite part of the year. And suddenly one of these whacked out guys would be dancing toward a hard, hard winter is coming, they would say. Deep snow, a bunch of wind, and make provisions, put up stores, and they would just dance into the earth, the sky, the tree. One evening, Lune came to all the villages, all one night. A hundred village fires where people would gather and tell stories and to see Lune said, You are in great danger, they said. They are coming. We have heard their axes in the forest. The wind is still shouting, I said. It was true. The wind bore the sound as it laughed and screamed and gunfire. The sad wind sighed. You must come with us, they said. If you stay, you will be driven from these mountains to a distant land. Your journey will be filled with suffering. You'll never see the graves of your ancestors. Come with us, God. Grandfather said, There was ritual. Cherokee must fast for four days and four nights. And those who had fasted could see the wind. And one night, return and leave them down the path, dancing toward their world, which lies on the other side of this world. On the last evening, Mene returned. Not all had kept faith, only a handful from each village followed the Mene through the moonlit world of Tundaba to the stone peak and disappeared. Mutre, no king, vanished into solid rock. The last Mene returned and talked to the curious villagers, the ones who had not kept faith. Mene spoke from the darkness. Said, you will no longer see us, but we will always be here. Grandfather said, Learn to listen, Jesse. Learn to listen. I think things are still here. They're dancing right through Taiwan City, trying to. Uh, a warrants of some uh, coming disaster. Well. When I went off to college, I was going to be a teacher or something. I thought I was really going to make it. My sophomore year or something, something happened. I couldn't sleep. I kind of missed stuff. The crows up on the ridge. You can only hear the fall in winter, and the fog coming off the Akalofty River. You can't see it now. It's behind the craft shops and the billboards, but it's there. I would look over to the east, and I'd see these mountains and hear it in. I guess I was just homesick. Well, Christmas break came. I went home, I didn't go back. Big disappointment to my mother. What are you going to do, Jesse? Sit on the bridge with the rest of the loafers? When I told her I got a job, she yeah. She said, when are you going to get a real job? Yes. My grandfather, she doesn't consider this work, but for other reasons. I love this thing. In the fall, when the tourists are gone, the leaves change, we go to the park. That is the time. Right. Wow. The air is full of leaves and they turn red, brown, and gold. I just feel like I would just lift off up, up to the sky, the clouds, and swirling leaves. And just boil up behind me like a, like a boat. I found this up like Blue Ridge Parkway. I only go up in the fall, the full moon, and have to leave my bike when it's full of the cliff. There's this mountain of chats right out of the cliff. 
It's really scary to get up on it, taking time. When I look over the edge, like the whole world is below you, there's nothing to see. The mountains, the moonlight, sparkling off the rivers and creeks and me. Something's there. Something timeless. Like that was there before the cities and the highways. Maybe it will always be there. Grandfather said we no longer can see who they We have lost the ability to see them. But I think that we can hear them. He doesn't like me to ride a bike in the summer. So I only ride a tune from work. Maybe a moonlight drive to the holiday. So, you want to go home with me? Have beer, watch a little TV? Zero, zero. Hello. I've got a, a Tachi, 46 inch, it's right out of sand. My Sears furniture is all over there. You want to go home with me? No. Well, come back and see me next summer. I'll be here. You remember, it's C O. It's like the letters of Alpha. C and O means hello. And then you say, Siki Sae. That means how are you? Then you say, stick it close to the You know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Like a deal again.